Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, looks like the rain has kept some folks away, or at least delaying them from getting here. I know we had over 120 students registered to be here. Um, but maybe they're coming, and that's okay. But the good, good thing is you all are here. So I want to welcome you. I'm Warren Hilton. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student and External Affairs at the Drexel University School of Public Health. I want to welcome you to our second Global Health Opportunities Day. And it's really a day all about you. How do you connect to global health opportunities? How do you get your questions answered about potentially being involved in the global health field? Uh, for some of you who've already done global health work, how do you further enhance what you've done? So today is really all about you. So you will see the way we have crafted the schedule to have our keynote here this morning uh, and then to have various panels so that you all can get your questions answered, see what opportunities are out there. Uh, obviously, we wish we could have brought 20 panelists for each panel, uh, but to keep it manageable, uh, we have a few uh, individuals on each panel that will talk about the opportunities their organization has. In addition, they will talk about kind of the things you need to do, even if you're not interested in their organization, to be involved in global health uh, and, and uh, to get your uh, experience in global health. So with that being said, I want to do a couple of things here first. Uh, I want to uh, switch over to a video here shortly uh, of my colleague, uh, Dr. Shannon Marquez, who is our Director of Global uh, Public Health Initiatives and our Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. She couldn't be here today, so she does have a welcome for you. If we can get the lights turned down on the stage. Good morning and welcome to the Global Health Opportunities Day. My name is Dr. Shannon Marquez. I'm the Director of Global Health Initiatives at the Drexel School of Public Health, as well as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Sorry I couldn't join you today. I've actually just arrived in China, visiting Xiamen University School of Public Health, here with Dr. Julie Mostoff, Vice Provost of Global Initiatives, and Dr. Long Zhan Lu from the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Enjoy your day. There'll be many opportunities to learn about training in global health, as well as learning from your peers who just finished summer experiences in global health around the world. Again, thank you for coming, and I look forward to meeting many of you when I return to Drexel. All right. So uh, after that welcome from Dr. Marquez, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce our keynote speaker for the day um, and get our program started. So we have the great pl pleasure today of having with us Dr. Stephen Larson, who's the Executive Director of Puntes de Salud, and he's also the Assistant Dean for Global Health Programs and an Associate Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania. He received his Bachelor's of Arts and Fine Arts from Haverford College and his MD from the University of Pennsylvania. Over the past 20 years, Dr. Larson has developed an extensive working knowledge of the healthcare issues facing immigrant populations in the United States, as well as underserved populations globally. Since 1988, Dr. Larson has immersed himself in the history of Central America and examine the impact of politics, geography, economics, and religion on healthcare. He visits frequently and has many personal and professional contacts throughout Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and El Salvador. In 1993, Dr. Larson established Frontline Medicine at Penn to help students and residents explore the complex issues facing underserved populations. In 1999, with the goal of collaborating with other medical educators nationwide committed to global health, Dr. Larson joined with other, joined, excuse me, IHMEC, the International Health Medical Education Consortium, now GHEC. In 2000, he was elected to its governing council. And through this relationship over the past 10 years, Dr. Larson has been able to identify an expanded range of clinical and research opportunity for Penn medical students. 
From 1993 to 2006, Dr. Larson served as volunteer medical consultant for Project Salute, a nurse-managed migrant health clinic located in rural southern Chester County providing health care to predominantly Mexican labor force employed in local agricultural industries. In 1994, Dr. Larson created an elective course on immigrant health for medical and nursing students, uh, and later in 2002, recognizing the rapid growth of an urbanized, undocumented Latino population, Dr. Larson founded Puentes de Salud, a community partnership dedicated to the health and wellness of this immigrant population through direct service and action focused on social determinants of health. To date, Puente de Salud has drawn more than 225 student and faculty volunteers broadly from across the campus of, campuses of University of Pennsylvania, Jefferson Medical College, Drexel University, and the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Puente de Salud has formed strategic partnerships with the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Women's and Children's Health Services, the City of Philadelphia, the Mexican Consulate, and the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. His organization serves as a community-based platform for partnerships with, the, with concerned local groups and stakeholders, as well as a training ground for the next generation of healthcare providers and educators. And that is why we have chose him to be our keynote speaker for today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Larson the coat because I'm not one for coats. I'd like to lose the tie too, but we'll do that later. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and um, this is sort of a labor of love for me. So I'm going to move fast. Got lots of slides, lots of ideas, and um, hopefully um, you, know, you guys will pick up some of the vocabulary. I'm sure some of it's familiar from coursework, um, but let's get going here. So some of the things we're going to talk about, and this spans the 20, well, I've been at this, I guess, for 30 years since I was a med student. Uh, yeah, I'm an old guy. Um, but we're going to talk about lessons learned and lessons applied. And, uh, and I'll give you an example of how I think through that. And at first, I, I always like to start off about this concept of painting masterpieces. Um, is, there a, is there a laser? Yeah. Um, Life-changing event. What's known as a sentinel event, if you talk to Nils Dallaire from the Global Health Council or Michelle Barry, who's uh, out at Sanford, um, uh, many people, Andre Jacques Nuzzi up at NYU, people who have been involved in global health since the 70s, they'll talk to you and describe to you this life-changing event, something that is significant. Concept of social determinants of health, this issue of theory and practice, population-based interventions, disruptive innovations, interdisciplinary teamwork, north-south partnership. A lot of these things are hot items like social determinants of health. Um, it's, it's a really up and coming in the Flexner uh, centenary report. You'll hear this being thrown out there, interdisciplinary teamwork, collaboration. So these are all the ideas we're going to talk about. Um, Ultimately, we'll talk a little bit about Puentes de Salud. You can certainly go online and Google it, and uh, you'll find a ton of information. We have lots of students who come down and get involved, and, and certainly we're uh, you know, always looking for um, bright-eyed folks. Um, so this guy passed away several years ago, but uh, in my younger years, I used to, for entertainment, watch Sunday morning channels where this guy would teach you how to paint a masterpiece with the edge of a palette knife in 30 minutes. Um, and um, and I, was, I was trained as a painter, so not that I took personal affront to that, but I, I just kind of wondered about that notion that you could do something so rapidly with, with just uh, 30 minutes of exercise. Um, anybody know who the artist is? It's a Dutch painter, Piet Mondrian, painted this back in the 1940s. It's called Broadway Boogie Woogie, and it's actually up in the MoMA. Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Now you might sit there and think, oh, conceptually easy. 
color planes, blocks of color all laid out. I can do that, right? We probably did this in second grade in art class, right? It's a little bit more complicated, right? This is this, try to dispel this notion that you can go out and paint a masterpiece w without thinking about it. So how did Mondrian get to where he was? Well, he tra trained in that post-impressionistic period, so you'll see a lot of color thrown around the way an early Monet or, or um, Cezanne or one of the Impressionists would do. Um, he's painting in 1910, 1920. Um, but what he's doing, he's not sitting in an insular space. He's not sitting in a classroom, right? He's working from life. And every day this guy takes a portable easel and goes out into the countryside and he uh, examines, he, he observes, he sees. And he's not just observing and seeing, he's doing, right? And over the period of time, when you follow his progress, his work, you begin to see that he's beginning to understand these really intricate relationships in space and color and composition that basically he's now at such a sophisticated level of understanding that he reduces things to a very simplistic composition and ultimately gets the Broadway boogie woogie at the height of his career, the end of his career. But if you go back in time and look at his work, there is a thread that ties it all together. It wasn't him showing up thinking, ah, I'm going to paint a masterpiece. So for students, um, it's, it's about going to the canvas and about practice. Um, so to talk about this in, in more context, this is where I grew up in South Jersey. You know, the running joke is you're either up in Hoboken or you're at an exit on the turnpike. We didn't have an exit. You actually had to drive a lot of miles to get to the exit. It was the rural countryside, and yes, I'm an old guy, and uh, majority of in the room, or I see a couple of people that could probably remember that black and white TV was the only TV we had back in those days, and it was a screen about this big. It wasn't high definition. Now, I didn't study by a kerosene lamp. This is Albert Schweitzer in Gabon, Africa. But these were the images that I was exposed to. There was no internet. So when I process information, it was through a National Geographic, or in this case, Life magazine, right? And so for me, my world was exploded by the notion of Albert Schweitzer, or this doctor, this rural doctor, who's captured here by the artist Eugene Smith in the 1950s. And they would do these photo essays. And um, you know, here's a doctor who's sewing up this child on the dining room table. Um, to me, that had an impact, particularly since my doctor was Dr. Rita Mariotti, who was an English major at Penn, who ended up getting her MD back in the 50s, early 60s, at MCP, which is the predecessor of your university, uh, Medical College of uh, Philadelphia, Women's Medical College of Philadelphia. Um, she was a fabulous family medicine doctor. I remember when my brothers threw me off a bunk bed and I had a concussion, you know, at 6 o'clock at night, lying in my bed, waking up to her shining a flashlight in my eyes. Doctors actually made house calls back then, and they made a difference. Now, you contrast that with the education that I got in the 1980s, when everything was about specialization at academic centers like Penn, Drexel, Temple. Um, and indeed, you will assimilate, if you're going into the medical side of this, this technology and this vocabulary, and you'll wield it you know, with tremendous ease over time. Um, all of the you know, the equipment of your trade, no longer in a black bag, spread out all over our trauma bay, where we can resuscitate people, intubate them, crack their chest, put in big bore IVs, do all this fancy, sophisticated stuff. What happened to me when I was at your stage, and the reason I'm excited about being here is, in the midst of all of this information and technology, um, I was living in West Philadelphia as a student. I didn't have a lot of money. And a buddy of mine had bought a row house, and he was, a work, he was out on workman's comp. He was a teamster and herniated discs, and was recovering, and he was refurbishing an old row house, sort of out in the boundaries, sort of demilitarized zone. And um, he invited me to live with him and his wife and their dog, Star, and I was the attic boy. I would help strip wallpaper, pour concrete, do whatever, um, in exchange for free, free room and board. 
Um, but what I got to know, and this is something that might escape all of you, and it has to do with perception, that's a whole other talk, but within that community, there was an elaborate degree of organization and infrastructure that to the passerby would escape them. Um, I mean, there was great pride in the community, great pride in, you know, the, in the support, the, in, the, the uh, interpersonal relationships. I was the judge of elections every year. I mean, it was, it was really interesting to sit in either the local barber shop or the local tavern and talk to the people. And you, you know, from this elevated Ivy League kind of 30,000 foot view, you, you wouldn't even notice it. But it was, it was for me refreshing to see that. Because at that time, I was really not into studying pathophysiology. And I was reading Camus and Malraux and Jean-Paul and really, really going off in a weird direction. Um, but I, I read this book, The Irrational Man, and I, and I came upon this, this quote, which was really relevant to me at the time. Specialization is the price we pay for the advancement of knowledge. It's a price because the path of specialization leads away from the ordinary concrete acts of understanding in the terms of which man lives his day-to-day -day life. For some of you, that will resonate, particularly, and I suspect it's a self-selected audience, people who are interested in global health, global issues, their relationship to the world. Um, unfortunately, back in the 80s, for me, uh, the walls were closing in. I was a second year med student, and I was already planning my escape. The internet didn't exist, and um, do you guys know what this is, the youngsters? <laughs> so I, I could be accused of having wicked attention deficit uh, disorder, uh, ADD. Um, and for me, this was always the bane of my existence. Going into a library and having to use the Dewey Decimal System to look up information in a card catalog and then go do research this way. Back then, this was the only way I could find out about opportunities, about the world, and um, I tried to identify opportunities to go abroad, because I was going to leave Penn for a year and just disappear. And um, one of my colleagues who's up at NYU, Alan Keller, who runs their Survivor of Tortures program, we were friends at the time, and he was going through the same thing, and he managed to end up in Kampuchea, or in Cambodia-Thai border, working in refugee camps. And so I was like, Alan, I'm out of here. I got to figure out where to go. But unfortunately, there were no offices of global health programs. They didn't exist, and there was no interest. Um, if I had an interest, I, we had an international programs depart or section or office, um, but they were looking at establishing relationships in Russia and in Colombia. And in Colombia, they were doing they were looking to establish a liver transplant program in Bogota. Who gets a liver transplant in Colombia unless you're a part of the Medellin cartel? You know, it was just the priorities and everything looking towards the global perspective were mixed up, at least from my perspective. And so I looked at a map. I knew my buddy was overseas in Southeast Asia. And I got on a plane and I ended up on the Mekong River. That's Pathet Lao on the other side in northern Thailand. And I traveled around for about six months trying to figure out. I couldn't do anything healthcare-wise because I was a med student. I had no skills, and access into NGOs was really difficult to do. Um, but I, I went looking for something. Um, it's actually a, a skinny me. Um, and what I realized is the thing that brought me to medicine, going back to Dr. Mariotti and those images of Eugene Smith and Albert Schweitzer, and it was this notion that there is this thing, the human condition, which I think is really important to embrace. So we had come out of a war in Southeast Asia, and it was a nasty war, and there were a lot of things done, um, a lot of lives lost, a lot of resources wasted, a lot of missed opportunities. And so for me, that was sort of like the heart of darkness, you know, that Joseph Conrad book, going upriver into that, not knowing what was around the bend. And, and so for me, ending up in Southeast Asia, it was almost in a way kind of traumatic, but it was enlightening because I sitting on the Mekong River with a mother combing her daughter's hair, father working in the field, grandparents working on some sort of machine. You realize, not that the difference is in all of us, right? You realize the similarities. We all worry about certain elements in our lives. We worry about food. We worry about shelter. We worry about the safety of our children. Um, and 
the basic elements that define all of us. And so that, for me, became um, really what this Sentinel event meant to me and, and how I was going to figure it out. It wasn't a masterpiece, right? It was just me going out trying to figure this out. So, you know, you do a lot of reading and you find people who can share ideas and, and as Mark Twain does here in Innocence Abroad, the beauty of travel. Um, back in the 1980s, the only opportunity I could really get to have a somewhat mentored experience in what you would consider global health was working out on the Bering Sea with the Yupik Eskimo with, under the uh, Alaskan Area Native Health Services. So I spent three months um, in um, the village of Bethel, Alaska, and it's no roads, it's 350 miles from Anchorage, it's all rivers and Bering Sea Ocean, and there were about 52 Indian uh, Native American villages there, uh, Yupik Eskimo, and in an area the size of Oregon. And it was staffed by family physicians. There were seven family physicians and one internist, and they provided care for this entire region. This is where I was introduced to promotoras, or mid-level providers, or health educators. She actually is one of those. And these were women, and mostly women. You had to have at least eight years, I mean, uh, an eighth grade education, and speak English fluently. Um, and they would be taught um, health promotion uh, and as well as physical exam and diagnosis. And they would staff these little health posts. They're like the barefoot doctors in China back in the 50s. Um, and they were the eyes and the ears for the doctors at a main base in Bethel, Alaska. And every day those doctors would get on a short wave and talk with the health promoter or the, the, um, the health worker in that village. And they would go over all of the sick babies, all of the pregnant women, you know, checking vital signs and any complications, new illnesses. Um, for me, that was a real shock coming from Penn in this ivory tower of academic medicine where even the notion of a family medicine doctor was an inferior model for healthcare delivery. Um, I got to do a, a, a week of well baby visits and uh, it was amazing because it wasn't with a physician, it was with the old school public health nurses. I mean, they were like the military operations. You would just about parachute into this village and for the next week, you would weigh, vaccinate, you would just see everybody in the village. And those guys knew the community, right? Amazing to work with, amazing to see in operations. And again, something outside of my sphere of education. Um, about this time, I ended up being a resident, graduated in med school and started my residency. And it was harder to go around the world or far away. And I'd always had an interest in Latin America and, this was after we had invaded Panama and the, in Oaxaca, there was this protest. And I was traveling through, and as luck would have it, I ended up crossing the border into Guatemala during the Civil War. And, um, and I ended up in the highlands. And um, for those of you familiar or not familiar with Guatemala, they went through um, basically a Cold War-driven left versus right sort of ideology, Civil War. Um, that more or less pitted the haves against the have-nots. The have-nots clearly in larger numbers, most of them indigenous. Um, and uh, the war left the urban areas and went out into the rural countryside. And up in the north, in the Ischil Triangle, there was basically genocide. And many of the men were either disappeared or fled. And the villages were left barren. Um, women were unable to work the fields. So you had uh, hunger and uh, mass sort of exodus back into the cities, um, and people in search of food. Very pretty area if you've ever been to Antigua. This is Antigua before the, the more recent sort of tourist boom. The war is over down there and things have changed. But when you practiced healthcare back in the 80s in Guatemala, um, it didn't resemble healthcare as we practice here. And it's the first obvious thing, right? And you would see hard decisions made um, in, for instance, in the city where there were maybe six ventilators. And you had to decide who was going to be put on the ventilator. Was it the 70-year-old with a cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, and stage renal disease? Or was it a young guy with Guillain-Barre who's salvageable? We don't think like that in the United States. 
thankfully we're not necessarily forced to think like that, but these are the hard daily decisions that suddenly I'm confronted with having left this type of medicine. Um, when you see somebody who's been hit by a car, that's the way you would treat a hip fracture as a first aid sort of, you splint one leg with the other. Very effective. So this, and you can see it's partially sort of internally rotated and a little bit longer. Uh, the bottom line is this guy's been sitting in a squintla in, in a lowland hospital for a week without access to a CAT scan to determine the degree of his intracerebral injury. Um, this is a guy who gets hit by a car and he's got the classic battle sign, a basal skull fracture. But you'll never know. He's ataxic, he's got diplopia, he's got nausea, but you're not going to be able to help this guy. Um, young kid during an epidemic of cholera that came up from Peru back in the days, in the uh, early 90s, ends up dying this evening because there's no ET tube when she aspirates to secure her airway. And, um, you know, again, you work in this environment. People who have been in this room, I'm sure, have been in this environment. You know, God forbid you're the recipient of these rubber gloves after they've been recycled a dozen times. We couldn't even conceptualize, get our head around this, right? Um, labor and delivery floor, limited resources. So, essentially, it's this notion of theory and practice. You know, we're theoretically taught a way of looking at a problem but then you hit the realities, right? And I'll give you an example. Um, we're in the Mosquito Coast in Bluefields playing dominoes. This is actually up the road in Pearl Lagoon. Uh, you have to get there by a motor launch. And your buddy keels over, has a sudden MI, right? Well, you hope you have four sober guys that can carry him to the launch that takes you up the river, that takes you to an ambulance that now can nav navigate a dirt road seven hours to Managua, where your ICU unit is, and they get to the ICU unit, but that's not an ICU unit that any of us are familiar with. There are no monitors. There's one big tank of oxygen. So what we're trained, the 90 minutes door to balloon, the algorithm that we use here in Philadelphia, suddenly goes out the window. And everything that we've been taught and lived by, we suddenly realize in the real world, and we'll talk about what the real world is, it's, it's kind of a lie, right? Which is, I think, why we're all in this room trying to figure this out. As a young clinician or as a young student, when you go into this, you make decisions. You either walk away appalled, because I, I came back and gave a Grand Rounds talk on Guatemala healthcare back in the 80s, and people just about left the room in protest. I mean, how dare people practice that kind of medicine? It's, it's primitive, it's you know, terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Well, if you, and so it's, you, you make a conscious decision, you're either going to go back into that and try to figure it out so you can leverage some good, or you walk away and never go back. And majority of the students that I've encountered over the years will actually never go back. It's a very small subset of people who will continue to keep going out into the field with their canvas to try to understand the intricacies, right? Um, for me, I kept going back. This is after Hurricane Mitch in 96 in Nicaragua. And these are people whose villages were destroyed living in these tablecloth little shanties on the side of the road, um, cardboard. And you know, you would go to a clinic, you would go on what's known as a medical mission, and you would wake up in the morning to find 100 people waiting for the gringo doctor to come and heal them. And you would enthusiastically embrace that and start you know, seeing hundreds of patients, and then you suddenly realize, well, what am I really doing? When I run out of that sophisticated blood pressure medicine that was donated and I brought down here, what's going to happen to the blood pressure of this village, of this patient in this village? Who's going to continue that? What am I really doing? I make myself feel good, right? But what am I really accomplishing? And, um, and yet you see this endless stream. I mean, it's just never stops. Um, and I can tell you this, it's like the book, the book about death and dying. You go through stages, you know, of anger and you know, denial. I mean, 
ultimately, as an individual who cares and as a practitioner, you will sit and think, well, what am I really trying to do here? And this is that branch point where you either decide you're never going to come back or you're going to roll up your sleeves. If you decide to stay, now you're in a really unique place because by default, you default to the things you're comfortable with. So yeah, you're going to begin to understand the pathophysiology of the endemic illnesses. And in this case, you know, this is a chart of all the parasites, the antihelminthics and the amoebas and the things that you're going to be looking for in their stool, right? You're going to understand you know, malaria, HIV, TB, and you're going to understand it if you go back into this in the context of the medical infrastructure. I mean, these professionals have functioned in a certain capacity under certain really rigid restrictions in terms of resources and, and access for years. And what's evolved is a fairly sophisticated manner in which healthcare is dispensed. And you need, you know, rather than just dismiss it, you want to embrace it. You want to understand how these guys think. They get really creative. I mean, they go to Ace Hardware and find stuff that they use. But you need to experience that. You need to understand the limitations of your medical pharmacopoeia. You know, I don't have a state of the, I don't have Zosin. Can I get by with back from flagell, right? I don't have these things. I'm, I'm trained, I'm dependent on them because that's the way I've been trained. But what do I do in the real world? You begin to understand how geography, like that, that guy in Bluefields who gets medevaced out by his buddies, how geography affects healthcare. I mean, it's fascinating when you look at the, you know, the history of Bluefields, which is an English name in a Spanish-speaking country, and then you understand how the geography, the Spaniards couldn't control that region. The Dutch and the English wanting a piece of the action sort of laid claim. And so you have these two cultures. One that has ex-slaves brought from Jamaica. So you have a, a very large African population on the east coast of Nicaragua. And then the mountains create a barrier and then it's a Spanish speaking. And that's had severe, you know, significant implications into you know, the allocation of resources by the various governments, um, which, you know, you, you need to understand history if you're going to talk about Guatemala and the indigenous population, the arrival of Alvarado, uh, Alvarado in, in the 1500s, the conquest of the Mayans. Did they really get conquered, you know? And the, the sort of fabric of their society, religion, very big, right? Um, I got to see, you know, after the Vatican II, the sort of dismantling of faith-based, um, Catholic faith-based sort of um, populations to Baptists and, and Protestants. Uh, very interesting in, that the, if you wanted to be more mainstream um, in Guatemala, you saw a shift in the upper echelon moving over into Protestantism. Um, Economics, obviously, if you're an agrarian-based economy, you're going to have profound limitations in your resources and how you allocate them. The politics, needless to say, you know, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, up into the 80s, this was huge. Now, I love this photo. This is the, my most favorite photo of all. This is shot in Managua, or on the road from Managua up to Matagalpa. And two guys on a motorcycle with a motorcycle. Come on, man. But I'm standing up in the back of a pickup truck taking that. So it's like, I fly, my trauma buddies love that photo. Um, and, you know, and ultimately you get to education, you get to sanitation, you get to water, you get to nutrition, shelter. And when you're done, after you've gone back to the fields to paint and come back, and you begin to understand what it's really about. It's about inequities. You know, the ten, you guys familiar with like the 1090 rule? 10% of the population owns 90% of the wealth. Well, we're privileged in this country, but we're more privileged in the sort of professions that we've chosen, um, that we're at the top of the heap, so to speak. And so if, from a healthcare providing point, we look at it from a very advantaged perspective. Now, I was lucky back in the um, 90s to happen upon this group called CREA, the Committee for Health Rights in the Americas. And coming out of the Sandinista wars in Nicaragua, you had an influx, or during the Sandinista Contra war, you had an influx of uh, European and North American 
concerned citizens, basically leveraging resources and bringing them down. And, and the bottom line is this is a group, uh, Action Medica Christiana. If you don't know these guys, they're a great group doing great work with a great model. Um, they wrote the textbook for the School of Public Health in Managua. They're really, really good people. Um, but they would hold these, you know, sort of conferences where North American physicians and healthcare providers and advocates could go down and you would be exposed to the Sandinista perspective, the Contra perspective. You'd go to villages that were pro-Contra, pro-Sandinista, and, and you would just be exposed to all of this. And you would be exposed to models for healthcare delivery. So in the case of AMC, they were given the RON, the autonomous region in the north from the Rio Coco and Honduras border all the way south to Bluefield. And that was their area that they were responsible for the health and wellness, given that by the Sandinistas. And they had no money. The war was going on, it was a wartime economy. And so these were all doctors, um, you know, traditional biomedically trained folks who realized they brought a knife to a gunfight and had to reinvent themselves. And they reinvented themselves in a public health population-based model. So for me as an internist, coming out of my training, my super specialized training in the 80s, this was like an eye-opener. I'm like, wow, these guys are making a difference. Um, and it's through them that I got introduced to the Whitehall studies, this concept of social determinants of health that you're hearing about. I, I dare say that five years ago, if you asked 100 board-certified physicians in a room who Michael Marmot was, maybe two people could tell you, or what the Whitehall studies were about, right? Nobody knew. But yet this was being constantly talked about in your circles in the public health domain, and, um, but not in mainstream medicine. Now, as it's caught on with the 2005 commission, you know, they're looking at the causes of the causes, basically the, the socially determined conditions that, in which people grow, live, work, and age, the social determinants of health that impact their health care. So getting these ideas from this group of folks sitting in, in Nicaragua doing this really cool stuff. So for me, here was the obvious, right? I could walk into the highlands in Guatemala, I could see this kid with a protuberant abdomen, I could see the apathy, the, you know, the skin changes, the brittle hair. I could diagnose malnutrition. More than likely, in addition to lack of food, high worm burden, right? Parasites, ah, I can treat that, right? I can give them medication, I can orally rehydrate them, I can have them purge their worm burden over the next month, They'll feel good. Feel good for what? About a month. Until they're back out into the environment that they came from, right? It makes more sense if I now go literally, proverbially, upstream and I start thinking about the source of water. How do I get pure water, clean water, to their houses? How do I educate people? This is dengue, but I, ha I had one for cholera, um, which has the similar sort of visual imagery about sanitation and avoiding it, um, but you educate people, right? And you help them to understand the oral fecal root. Uh, this is what Action Medica Christiana did in Nicaragua in the late 80s, early 90s. And so this was the model that, it's like, duh, why wait for a diabetic to come into my ER with a glucose of 600? It just doesn't make sense. Teaching them about animal husbandry, hygiene, Great stuff, right? It wasn't anywhere on my radar. It wasn't anywhere in my repertoire having trained in this biomedical sort of model. And yet, from a perspective of the health and wellness of a community, equally, I would argue even more, more important than what I could do by simply throwing pills at somebody, right? So at the same time, because I had responsibilities here, I wasn't able to fly out of the country for long periods of time. Um, a friend of mine introduced me to a group down here. This is, I don't know what Lada is. It's just a great map. But uh, you know, you've got New Jersey, you've got the Delmarva Peninsula. This is Delaware, southeastern Pennsylvania. This is Maryland, Virginia. But this area that's yellow is essentially garden. It's fertile. It's land that's being farmed, right? And um, this is Brandywine River Valley area, right? And where you have farms, you have crops. And it turned out that um, in southern Chester County, the cash crop actually for the state of Pennsylvania, did you know it was mushrooms? Who would have guessed, right? Over a half a billion dollar a year industry. 
But where you have agriculture, you need workers. And so there was a group of immigrants, this happened to be Mexican, um, that ended up here and they needed health care. Um, Virgin of Guadalupe. I mean, you could go, it was like Steinbeck Grapes Wrath. You would see, uh, Chester County is the wealthiest county in the state. Did you guys know that? Yet, it has this invisible population. And back then, there were about 20,000 20, Mexican nationals who had, because of the economic gradient in the 80s when the peso was devalued, had moved north to take up agricultural jobs working in these mushroom fields. And they lived in these invisible communities. Because Kenneth Square, did, you know, you can pick our crops, but don't live in our community kind of mentality. And, um, and they needed health care. And um, I heard about this woman uh, who's served as my mentor and, and really taught me everything, Peggy Harris. A nurse practitioner. So in the 90s, the early 90s, when you know the whole healthcare reform debates took place with Hillary Clinton, um, and they were driven by a variety of different reasons. One was a manpower shortage in primary care. The government sort of eased up on the restrictions on nurse practitioners and allowed them to practice to the full sort of scope of their training. And these guys, and you can go, um, Pat Garrity. You guys know her. Yeah, Pat's a classic example of somebody who took that opportunity to position themselves in communities in need and bring their game. And Peggy Harris did that in Kennett Square. Margaret Catronio did that out at the Health Annex in West Philly. Where there ever, wherever there was an underserved community that a physician didn't have the guts or whatever, the interest in setting up shop, nurse practitioners went in. And uh, believe me, they, they brought their game. Um, and so I, I showed up with Peggy Harris, and you know the, the law in the state of Pennsylvania, and it varies by state, is that a nurse practitioner has to have a su supervising physician. Um, but for me, it was like um, I, I was the supervising physician. But the real show was Peggy Harris. But to see this, you know, she could see 200 patients in a week and pull aside the 10 or 15 that needed a higher level of acumen, diagnostic acumen. And then I would come in, and on a, an afternoon, I could tee those guys up and pull out the one or two that needed to bridge into an academic center for tertiary care. And it was a neat model. And we started bringing students down. And, and um, I probably, I had Drexel students. You guys have that dual track. What's the practice? Yeah, I, I would mentor these guys down there. And it, you know, you had to talk. Like this guy with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, hypoxic sitting in, in, in the fields working, you had to think, you know, first off, to get them from the fields to you was a you know, 20 mile ride. And how are you going to take care of this guy with end stage lung disease? You know, you had to start thinking about the politics, you know, the Immigrant Reform Control Act. You had to think about the Public Responsibility Work Opportunities Act or welfare reform. You had to think about the, the fact that this guy's making $11,000 a year. How's, you know, how are we going to get this guy the care he needs? And so that led me to sort of conceptualize this thing called Frontline Medicine, which was a, a fund that sent students out of the country for these exposures to the group like AMC, but also took down to um, Kenneth Square. And it was about encouraging them to leave their com comfort zone. This is a guy, he's out in uh, Boise, Idaho now, runs an HIV clinic. Um, Clay Roscoe, great guy. This, this was the reason I did it and why I still do it today. I mean, you can read all of this, but. This is a kid who's sitting on the Rio Coco and gets a nasty enteric illness, and he's stooling his life away. I mean, he's having hallucinations and wondering if he's going to survive. But he goes, and so in my time in Nicaragua, I came to understand much better this isolated existence and asked myself many questions that were often as political in nature as well as medical. That's the sentinel event. That's the moment where you guys, as young, in your formative years, realize, aha, there's something more than just Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, that there's you know, that this world is so interconnected and interrelated. And so I found a group of folks, if you don't know GHEC as an, as an institution, you should be a member. Um, you're going to find like-minded people, many of them public health based, many of them um, educators who share a tremendous volume of information and resources. It, it came out of the 90s, a bunch of family medicine docs created IMEC. And uh, so I got to meet these guys and, you know, like minds. And every year they put on a conference. And, um, and then at that time, as global health became popular, we formed this program for global health. And 
And this is where it gets dicey. Because I stopped doing what I used to do, which was dump students abroad. And, that, and we'll talk about this, I think, in panels. There's some great opportunities here to discuss. As you started dealing with a guy with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and you started understanding the compl complexities of immigration, you know, there's this, all this anti-immigrant push. Um, this is a guy, Jeff Passell. He was at the Urban Institute. He now is the head demographer at the Pew Hispanic Center. So any data that's out there about immigration, about the Mexican community, he's the author. Brilliant guy. We're going to try and get him up to Penn to speak in December, and I'll send you all an info. But this guy, back in 1992, looked at the trends in the US population, and he noted one thing, that white non-Hispanic numbers were dropping, that the African-American population has re remained a relative 12% of the population in total for the past 100 years, and that the real growth was in the Hispanic population and the Latino population. This is in 1992. This guy's saying, whoa, I'm looking at this data. Something funny coming up. I'm seeing it in my work at Project Salud. He comes up with this graph at the same time saying, you know, if this continues, by the year 2008, the Hispanic population, the Latino population in this country is going to eclipse the African-American population. Well, what do we know about this? We know that that happened in 2000, so the rate of rise is even steeper, right? Why is that? I'm a conspiracy nut theory, and I always love to, I go to page nine of the Inquirer if I wanted to get news or whatever, because that's where the good stuff is. And the governor of Iowa in 1999 was petitioning INS, the precursor to ICE, Immigration Naturalization Service, to allow him to go down to Central America to recruit 20,000 young people. Why? Why did the governor of Iowa, an Aggie state, need that? Because guys like me were getting old. We couldn't throw a bale of hay on the back of a truck. Right? And if you looked, well, I don't know where the male piece is, but it parallels this, um, that the belly of this curve is in the 50-year, you know, older people, not able to do the manual labor. And so in 2004, if you looked at the population of the Hispanic popula growth, it's, it's in the young people's, because the demand for labor went so high. And who responded? Young, able-bodied folks from Central and Latin America. Now, why do I tell you that? And how does that have to do with anything about me sending students out of the country? At the same time, in 2003, if you go to the Institute of Medicine's Health Disparities Report, it is clear, crystal clear, that we who spend more money per capita on health care aren't getting the bang for our buck. And where we really drop the ball is in socioeconomically deprived populations, particularly along racial lines. So here we have, on the one hand, the most rapid growth in our country in this population that we're doing the worst at, right? 10 years later, do you know what this is? <laughs> I, I, I kid you not. I, 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 sat on, I wrote the strategic plan for Penn in the community. I'll never sit on another strategic planning committee ever again. This is data that looks at Medicare, Medicaid readmission rates 30 days after being discharged from a hospital. Now, what does this tell me as a doctor? This is the Delaware River, and I'm not quite sure why it's white and then blue, but this is the Schuylkill. This is West Philadelphia. That's my catchment area at Penn. Those are patients that I'm responsible for. What this tells me is if you're my patient in the shadows of my institution and you get discharged, you lead the city of Philadelphia in readmission rates. I got a problem with that. A lot of problems. But the bigger problem that I have is, all right, we export tobacco out of this country, right? We, we shove it down developing countries' throats. Fast food? Just go spend time in the highlands of Nicaragua and watch a kid drinking a big gulp, where before it was rice and beans and water. We've exploited these markets. We're doing the same thing with healthcare. Why would I? <laughs> these things are clearly bad for your health, but if we're doing it really bad here, why would I export that out of the country, right? Because who am I exporting to? I'm exporting it to, in many cases, under-resourced, you know, folks with melanin in their skin. If I can't take care of them in my own shadows, what gives me the right to dump my doctors on them, right? Got to think about that. So basically, I was lucky because 
In 2000, this is from my helipad, the trauma bay, looking east. So New Jersey's on the other side. You guys are up over here, North Philly, where the Latino population historically was. But beginning in 2000, it started to grow in South Philly. And if you went to Geno's, and I use Geno's because Joey Venta had this anti-immigrant thing going. But if you looked at his neighbor back in 2003, you saw La Lupe's Mexican restaurant, right? And if you walk the streets, I mean, today, I was just down there two days ago, South Street, I mean, Italian market is now the Mexican market. Um, it was changing, and there was a need. And it was very clear that there was a rapidly growing immigrant community in response to the labor demands. Today, it's probably close to 30,000. It's young population. There's parity men and women. Where you have young men, young women, this myth of anchor babies, people coming here to have a baby, forget about it. Why would you go from Puebla, Mexico, 2,500 miles to Philadelphia to have a baby when you can have the baby in Texas or Arizona. So just think about that. But young men, young women make babies. So we have young families. They're employed in low-paying jobs. And for me, thinking back on all of the time spent going to and from developing countries, I realized that I had to embrace it in a really holistic manner if I'm going to make a difference in somebody's health and wellness, which I take the Amada, you know, WHO, 1940s is when this was written. It, health is the state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And so we basically pulled together a, a cadre of colleagues interested in these issues, and we basically built a nonprofit. Um, the guiding principles that we work collaboratively with the communities and the stakeholders I got to tell you, when I did the strategic plan at Penn and they wanted models for how Penn was going to invest in the community, well, you know, obesity is a real issue in West Philly and there's government funding. So let's do a program on obesity because we can get it funded and talk about diabetes. Well, maybe people have other concerns in that the obesity thing isn't their major one. Maybe they're worried about their 15 year old kid coming home from school alive or advanced, you know, there are other priorities. So, you have to work with the communities. You have to build relationships with stakeholders. That was the first principle. It has to be multidisciplinary. Right tool, right job. Didn't need a doctor sitting in a clinic 40 hours a week when you could use a nurse practitioner. You could use mid-level providers, community liaisons. Um, and ultimately, you, you have to address social determinants of health. So to do that, we took this sort of hierarchical physician at the top, threw them out didn't want this to be a physician-centric approach to healthcare. And instead, if anything, it's our community nurse liaison in the center, but surrounding it with people with skill sets that can be leveraged into the community. And then we took, and so we have this really great interdisciplinary gang of, of folks that come to Puentes. And then we took that platform, if you will, and leveled it in the community, and now it becomes a sort of a fulcrum, a place where stakeholders can leverage with resources, right? So now we can build relationships with academic medical centers, uh, nonprofits, archdiocese, other people concerned about the wellness of this community, not doctors, not healthcare providers necessarily, but people with, with interests, with resources, groups like HIAS. Um, and so our, you know, when you don't have money, and we don't have money, um, you build these really cool partnerships, and they're based on trust, they're based, based on vision, and so this is just a, a sampling of some of them. And now we basically are able to provide culturally, linguistically competent primary care services, um, triplets that we delivered at Pennsylvania Hospital with my colleague Jack Ludmere, one of the co-founders. Um, you know, we can do, what does it really take to take care of people's health? I tell you what, what I learned from Peggy Harris is not a whole lot. You can do a great job with basics. We have partnerships with dental, um, dental services, social services. We do uh, emergency medical applications, S-chips. We work with highest victims and witnesses of South Philadelphia. We run education programs. I'm tired of 15-year-old kids ending up in my ER with a gunshot wound to the chest. That's a, that, that's a root cause analysis waiting to be done, right? It's a systems failure, healthcare systems, education systems, social services. I mean, you could go on and on and on. How do you prevent that? It's not a new way of treating a sucking chest wound or uh, you know, a young kid who's got a tubal pregnancy. It's to prevent it, and that requires you to invest in 
upstream, in the kids, in the community, right? So we run a ton of education programs. This is our Puentes Hacia el Futuro program. If people are interested in volunteering, you can go to our website. We're always looking. We have about 53 kids now in the program, children, and about 100 volunteers, and we pair them up with mentors one day a week. And, um, and our goal is to basically now, that with the models in place, is to expand it. Right now we're using space open two nights a week, uh, as well as one day a week for OBGYN. Um, but we're at that transition point where um, space has been allocated and we're really close. We want to, again, develop the health programs, education programs, and social service programs in a sort of a central location and, um, and expand all of our service hours. And so the university's given me this space down on 1700 South Street, and they're about 6,000 square feet, and it's going to become the future headquarters for Puentes. Um, half of this space is clinical, the other half runs all of our education programs. Um, this is the sort of the Community Design Collaborative um, pro bono did the architectural mock-ups for us. And this is the sort of waiting room area. Um, so that's coming, we just kicked that off and, um, and that's the future for Puentes. Now, getting back to the global health, because I know we have only a few more minutes, where do you go? What, what am I talking about now when I'm thinking global health? You can continue to put students in developing countries, but if you really want to get your bang for your buck, you want to think about this concept of a north-south partnership. And that means, rather than me going to Antigua Guatemala, or Atitlan, Guatemala, where Penn has established a clinic, um, a medical model based on US models in a developing country, um, which I think is a huge mistake, rather than embark on that kind of program development, you think about what that does. If you're the local Guatemalan physician who's been practicing for 20 years in that community and knows it intimately, understands limited resources, all of a sudden the gringo docs with a cornucopia of supplies and resources undermines who you are, undermines your authority, your, the community's value of your skill sets, and it disrespects you in a way. And, but the American doctors don't necessarily think about that. And so um, rather than, it's kind of like medical imperialism, I'd say, think about building partnerships with the South and at the collegial level, at the academic level. And that often involves not just sending doctors north, South, bringing doctors North. And I'll give you an example. I know we're running out of time, but just trauma. I'm trained in advanced trauma life support. Somebody comes in, I think about the mechanics of their injury and I'm on an algorithm to manage them. Oftentimes it involves a total body CT scan, unlimited resources. Well, guess what? In Guatemala, the main trauma hospital doesn't have a CAT scanner. So whatever values I bring to Guatemala as a trauma doctor, I can't impose them on Guatemala because Guatemala can't do that. But what I can do is bring Guatemalan doctors up here and introduce them to trauma and shift their paradigm. You know, we ran trauma by orthopedists in the 60s. After the Vietnam War, we realized you don't die from blunt trauma, you die from penetrating injuries. So it was handed off to surgeons who are gonna go into your thoracic and deal with large vessels and all of that. Guatemala trauma is still run by orthopedists. So I can help them wrestle with that transition, but I can't tell them they need to do it, they have to do that. So this is the North-South partnership. And then ultimately, if you build a little focal point for education in Guatemala and you empower those physicians and those institutions to be the specialists in, in aspects in Guatemala that are relevant to the, the population, the geography, the history, the resources, guess what? You can cross-pollinate that from Guatemala to El Salvador, from Guatemala to Mexico, from Guatemala to Honduras. That's a South-South partnership. So you go North-South, and you end up South-South. This is your goal, South-South partnership. And if you go to Pajo, you'll see that this is a hot topic, something that people are talking about. Mexico actually has such a program looking at vaccinations and public health issues that are shared, commonality. Anyway, um, we're in the early stages of building such a partnership in Mexico. This is in the White House in Los Pinos in, in Mexico City. That's, that's actually Lisa Nutter. And that's the First Lady of Mexico. And, um, ooh, missing a picture. There's actually a, a photo of the village where we've been working to leverage a presence. And it's in its early infancy. 
Healthcare providers aren't going to be down there for five years until all of these other little pieces are built up and the, and the uh, relationship with the community is, is established. I know I'm, I went a little bit over, but um, we'll have time. I think there's a panel discussion to hit on all these ideas, and uh, hopefully that's some help for you. Thank you, Dr. Larson. That was a very good talk there. I learned a lot, uh, as I always do when I come to these things. So uh, we're going to uh, prepare for our panel. But before we do, uh, I need to uh, do some housekeeping items. I need to certainly thank uh, all of the co-sponsors of this event, uh, along with uh, our School of Public Health. Uh, we were financially supported by the Office of International Programs. Uh, as well as the Student Life Office here at Drexel. Uh, we had our partners in the College of Arts and Sciences, the International Area Studies Program, uh, the College of Nursing and Health Professions, uh, School of Medicine, Biomedical Min uh, Engineering, uh, the Pannonia Honors College, Drexel Fellowships Office, as well as the Drexel Study Abroad Office all come together to make this event happen for students. So there's a a lot of folks out there at Drexel who uh, want to make sure that you all get the pertinent information about global health. Now, as we begin to transition to our first panel, um, Joshua, if you want to come up that side and get the microphones on the table. Um, during our first panel, just to give you an idea of what's going to go on, uh, the panel is called, uh, what do, uh, excuse me, opportunities, uh, what's out there? Opportunities for work and volunteer in global health. And so uh, you're going to get a flavor of what type of opportunities that different organizations have for you and what you need to begin thinking about in order to prepare for those uh, type of organizations and, and opportunities as well as how do you go about applying for different programs and things of that nature. So we have a good mix on our panel. We have folks from the Global Health Fellows uh, Program uh, too. Uh, I believe Kendall Snyder and uh, Celine, Salam, am I saying it right? Here, uh, Lara uh, from ESF is here, and uh, Dr. Larson is, is going to join us on that panel as well. Uh, and the questions are really going to be geared towards helping you understand, like I said, what opportunities are out there. Uh, and that panel is going to be uh, moderated by our very own Fee Nguyen. Fee Nguyen, I saw her earlier. Where'd Fee go? Is she gone? All right. All right, so um, we're going to get set up for that panel and um, take a short, very short, one-minute, two-minute break. Uh, 